Amphibians have always um, been very curious little creatures. I grew up in rural West Virginia, so I, I grew up flipping rocks, looking for salamanders, chasing lizards and things. And I remember as a kid flipping over rocks and logs. It was fascinating. It was like this whole other world that I had no idea existed. But what's really cool to me about the Southeast is just the sheer diversity of the amphibians and even the reptiles that are down there for North America. For salamanders in particular, uh, there literally is nowhere else in the world that has more species. We live in a very important area, biologically, very biologically diverse. It's like you live where you can see more salamander diversity than anywhere else on the planet. Most of the students don't know that, and certainly even people who grew up here a lot don't know that. It's, it's kind of amazing. Even as simple as something like how cool they look, right? The colors, so you get bright red, you get green one. Southern Appalachia is the salamander biodiversity hotspot of the globe. You can't beat it anywhere, not in the Amazon, nowhere. Like, this is it. So diversity-wise, it's amazing. Each point is, uh, is a little island, basically. Each mountain top is a little island for salamander communities that have been separated for so long that they've speciated. It's a great place to focus on amphibians and salamanders. In many of those streams, they're the only predators, and so you've got this um, this animal that's essentially acting like a lion on the Serengeti, right? It's just on a really small scale in these headwater streams, and I think that's pretty fascinating. You know, there there are literally dozens of species w within 30 miles of here, so uh, that in itself is pretty exciting. And you know, that's a place where you know on a a moist warm night that you can find dozens of animals in just a few minutes you know scurrying around on the forest floor. And uh, you know as you get older you, you've noticed you don't see as many of these things and so that's a, a big alarm to me. There's such a huge story there to tell and it's just not been told yet and it's a beautiful beautiful story. They're really in need, right? Like, you know, more than 50% of all salamanders, more than 50% of all turtles are, are imperiled. Realistically, uh, because of these joint pressures of climate change and disease and, and, um, and habitat loss, that uh, we have to recognize that, that some species are probably facing extinction, and I hope that that serves as a wake-up call. Yeah, there's lots of threats coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, the big ones, the obvious, uh, climate change. Yeah, I don't think it's hyperbolic at all to suggest that um, every impact that climate change is having will affect salamanders uh, and their habitats. Millions of years have allowed all this diversity, but it's not going to take that long to unravel it, you know. But there's a lot of uncertainty in that future. And the uncertainty, I would say, of the future of climate change is probably threat number one, because if we don't know, it's hard to plan. We see compounding variables coming in there that, um, that you know, we get higher disease rates when, when there's droughts. <laughs> and so they get hit from multiple sides, you know, and that all, it all kind of comes together when, when conditions are bad, right? Different uh, climactic effects on microhabitat allow the introduction of things that are not there right now. So that could be an invasive predator. In the case of salamanders, it's very likely to be a disease. There's the chytrids, which everybody, um, everybody studies. And then there's ranavirus, which fewer people study, but it's probably just as important as the chytrids. Everybody knows that, you know, the next unexpected disease could be right around the corner. And so that, as I said, coupled with all these other things could spell disaster. I'm just glad we don't have B-Sal over here yet. That's, that's the big one. Um, B-Sal is another one, which is a, a fungus. Asian origin, been moved inadvertently to Europe, where it is killing with 100% effectiveness on uh, certain salamandrids. It has not seemed to cause problems in the United States yet, but in Europe we know it's a, a threat. And the danger is if it gets to North America, what is it going to do to our wonderful species diversity around here? We've been operating uh, with the understanding that it's just a matter of time. You know, it will get here eventually. We won't, we won't know until it gets here if we've done enough. Yeah, we've got a head start now. We don't know how long this head start's gonna be here. I really hope that it's a permanent head start, but you never know. There could be, there could be something hidden in the trade right now that's just waiting to go bang. It's not easy to prepare for anything like that. And, and I could say this for like basically any threat we have, which is there's one way to really prepare for climate change, for disease, for 
the habitat fragmentation, any of those. And, and that's to leave large populations with lots of genetic diversity. That all, again, comes down to the choices we make about protecting the integrity of the habitats these species rely on. The habitat destruction underlies all of this. Everything has lost a lot of habitat. As you have a little patch of forest and another patch of forest, and you're, in a sense, creating more islands um, with more genetic bottlenecks because they won't cross these areas. You'd think they would, but they don't very much. And I think you have to think about the types of habitats that you're preserving. I mean, a lot, the biggest threat probably locally is development. Right? You open up a forest, it gets warmer, it gets drier, all those things. You decrease connectivity between populations. I think it's more important just to try to instill a general conservation ethic, make the argument that um, whatever's out there we should leave some space for, um, and then and try to do development in a way that's going to facilitate the persistence of, of those things. What I would say has been one of the more insidious threats to that is that We've been going through cycles and you know a century of chipping away at habitats. Well, you keep doing that, and eventually that threshold is crossed. But we're going to keep fighting to make sure that you know the salamanders and the, and the unique habitats that they need have a voice as well. Um, I think the future for salamanders is probably can to the future for most of our endangered species, which means that undoubtedly we're going to lose some. But I think there's a pretty, I like to think that there's pretty widespread awareness that we need to do something. I try to be positive on it, you know, I try to, um, I think you could go either way. I think we're really at this turning point of um, at least we're starting to realize how in trouble they are and we're starting to take conservation actions. There is so much we can do to, to, to impact how bad that's going to be. There's a range of potential futures out there, and it really does come down to how we, what we do. If they are given the opportunities to move to more habitable climate spaces, hopefully they will, as long as we're not in their way. It's important to recognize that the threats they're facing now, many of them are truly novel, both in terms of scale and the types of, of situations that we're putting these species in. But I, I believe in the adaptive and the resilient aspect of nature and have always put a lot of credence in that if we protect enough habitat, if we ensure the quality of those habitats, there will always be a future for salamanders. I am actually very optimistic. As we learn more and more and as we do get better at outreach. I, I, I do think as much outreach as possible helps. First, it's just education and, and, and showing people, telling people how interesting these things are. That's my main job at the station, um, K through 12, and also do a college classes about the biodiversity of the region. Part of our mission now is a very strong educational program, creating an army of young amphibian conservationists. People need to get involved and want to get involved, and, and we are providing a place where we can just in, in, encourage and engage everybody. And as much as salamanders um, uh, can be you know, somewhat difficult to locate, they're everywhere. Scientists estimate them as dense as one or two per square meter. In a lot of cases, you can interact with them. You can flip a log and you can put your face this close to a salamander. And there's something very personal about staring intimately into the face of a creature that is wildly, wildly different from you and is gonna sit there and stare right back at you. We have that here. No matter how slimy they are, no matter how weird they are to people, I have watched that aha moment transform someone from fear and skepticism to fascination and adoration. You know, why do we care about a work of literature or a work of art, right? Just because it's, it's beautiful and, and, you know, it may not resonate with you, but maybe it resonates with your children or your grandchildren. And so for, for those, for that reason, I think um, anyone can relate to sort of protecting something beautiful. All you need is the novelty of that experience and it changes you. So these, I mean, these critters are valuable because they can change.